Here is a story told to the children of Zambia in Africa. It's called Iwongelema. Once upon a time, there was a famine in Africa. There was no food to be had at all, and all the animals were starving. Now, in the center of a great jungle was a magic tree, and the animals knew that this tree would feed them with wonderful, nourishing fruit if only they could remember its name. But as there hadn't been a famine for many hundreds of years, no one had had to call the name of the magic tree for a very long time, and so it was forgotten, and not one of the animals could remember it. One evening, all the starving animals gathered together at the foot of the tree. They racked their brains and scratched their heads and tried all sorts of make-up names in the hope that they might guess the right one, like Punji Punji and Scooby Doodle. But the tree just remained with its arms spread wide and no fruit on it at all. I suddenly had a terribly good idea," said the lion. Somewhere in the dim darkness of my memory, I remember my great great grandfather saying that the mountain spirit knew the name of the tree. We must send one of the swifter animals in search of the mountain spirit to ask him. It was decided to send the hare because he was such a fast runner. So, gathering his little furry body together, he set off at a tremendous pace and found the mountain spirit. He bowed down low, feeling really rather frightened, and said in a humble voice, "Oh." Oh, mountain spirit! All my animal friends are dying of hunger, and we've forgotten the name of the magic tree. Could you tell us what it is? Yes. Well, you see, the name of the tree is a wongelema, a wongelema little creature. Now, have you got that? Are you sure? Well, go back to the forest quickly before you forget it. Oh, thanks. Said the little hare, and he turned his little body round, and with his white tail bobbing, he fled back to his friends. He ran as fast as his legs could carry him. When all of a sudden, bang, crash, whoosh, tipsy turvy, head over heels, stars flashing, lights twinkling, the little hare had run headlong into a huge ant hill and knocked himself quite silly. He made the rest of the journey reeling about and stumbling over his paws. Well. Well, what was the name? Quickly, asked the animals.、Uh, oh, oh, I've forgotten. Stupid creature! They said. Now, what are we going to do? Oh dear, we shall have to send someone else. Who shall we send? Let's send the buffalo. He's got a bigger head and perhaps a bigger brain. He'll remember the name. So the great hairy. Puffing, huffing, lumbering buffalo turned round and slowly galloped off into the sunset. When he reached the mountain spirit, he went down on his big cracked knees and said, "The、uh, oh mountain spirit, I'm afraid the hare forgot the name of the magic tree, so they set me along instead. Would you mind repeating it again?" Oh," said the mountain spirit, "how silly you animals are." The name of the magic tree is a wongelema. Now, have you got that? Don't forget it, and hurry back to your friends before you do. So the buffalo, overjoyed, set off in his great lumbering stride and trundled down the mountain, humming a little tune to himself as he went and watching the flies that were buzzing round his nose. It's a pity he did, because crash, bang, stumble, down he went. He too had run straight into the ant hill. Oh, oh my goodness me! He said, pulling himself together. What a shock I had! I'm all in pieces. What was I supposed to be doing? Oh, that's right. I was supposed to be remembering the name of the magic tree, and now it's gone straight out of my head. Whatever shall I say to the other animals? Well, of course, the other animals were beside themselves with rage. We shall all be dead soon, they said, unless we get the name of the tree. The old lion, who had first spoken about the mountain spirit, stepped forward and shook his huge and shaggy mane. There's nothing for it, but I shall have to go myself. I'm getting a bit old for this sort of thing. I'm exceedingly weak with hunger and very, very tired. However, as I seem to be the only sensible animal around here, I shall return at dawn with the name of the magic tree. Goodbye, friends. And he set off, loping through the twilight. 
When he reached the mountain spirit, he said, I'm afraid you'll have to forgive my friends. The buffalo has forgotten the name too, so I thought I'd better bring myself along. It's no good trusting these lesser beings. They haven't got my brains, you know. Be a sport, old man. Tell me the name of the magic tree. The name is Iwongalema, cried the spirit. Go back to the forest quickly and don't forget it. Oh, thanks, said the lion. You really are a, a great spirit. And he loped off down the mountainside. He felt very pleased with himself, exceedingly kingly, noble, royal. He held his head high, majestic, proud, a true king. But pride comes before a fall, and crash! Down he went, helter-skelter, head over heels, big paws floundering in the air, and his head, yes, buried in the anthill. Ugh! Ugh! These horrid creatures are uh, up my nose and in my mouth. Oh, get out. Oh, dear. Oh, now I've forgotten the name. I never dare show my face among my friends again. He looked with fear as he saw them approaching him. His heart beat fast, his whiskers trembled. It's no good. Don't get excited and don't bully me, because I, too, have forgotten the name. The animals collapsed in heaps about him. Some weeping, some sighing, some making no noise at all. Well, that's that, they all said. No chance of survival now. Please, said a small voice, just let me have a turn. Let you have a turn? What do you mean? Let me go to the mountain spirit and ask the name of the tree. All the animals looked down and saw it was a tiny tortoise with a nice shiny shell on his back. You're such a slow walker, by the time you get back we'll be dead, they said. I'll go as fast as I can, said the tortoise. Please, let me try. Oh, very well, off you go, said the lion. So the little tortoise turned and walked away, slowly, slowly into the forest. Now the tortoise, although he was slow, was a very reliable creature. He plodded on and on, not setting himself too fast a pace so he would get tired and not too slow in case he fell asleep. And as he went he counted. Thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty. Each little footstep he counted, and by the time he got to the mountain spirit he'd reached twenty-nine thousand five hundred and sixty-three and a half. Mountain spirit, he said. I'm awfully sorry about this, but I'm afraid that the lion, too, forgot the name of the magic tree. So as a last resort, well, I am rather slow. The animals have sent me. I don't know what to think, said the great mountain spirit. I think you're all very silly animals, and if you don't remember the name, I shan't tell it again. The name of the tree is Iwungilema. Now go back to the forest and don't forget it. Iwungilema, said the tortoise, and he set off down the mountainside. Iwungilema, Iwungilema, over the stones and over the grass. Iwungilema, Iwungilema. Over the dusty, sandy soil. He won't kill them. He won't kill them. Down to the dried up plants and bushes. He won't get. Oh, what a large ant hill. I think perhaps I'd better go round it. It's, it's too large to climb. He won't kill them. Oh, here are the other animals. He won't kill them. Well, well, can you remember the name? Shh, wait till I get to the tree. Well, here's the tree. Go on. What's the name? Ibongilema. The tree shuddered and shook, and from its branches fell juicy round fruit upon the heads of the animals. They ate and ate and ate their fill, and went to sleep happy and content, their stomachs bursting with the nutritious and delicious food. After that, 
They were able to eat each day from the tree until the famine was over. They were terribly pleased with the tortoise and never laughed about him being slow again. They almost made him king instead of the lion. But he was too modest to accept. Here is a story from Japan. In Japan, there's a huge and beautiful volcano called Fujiyama. This is how Fujiyama became a volcano. Long, long ago, there lived in Japan a man who worked in the forest looking after the bamboo. One day, as he was cutting bamboo with his hatchet, he saw a brilliant light shining in the dark green glade. It was a strange, mystic light. Fluorescent, luminous, milky white. Breathless with excitement, he crept quietly towards it. It led him on as if it were beckoning him. And there, lying on the ground, he saw a tiny, tiny baby girl. So beautiful that he almost wept to look on her. Now, this man had no children of his own. Although he was married to a sweet, kind woman, so when he saw the little child surrounded by a beautiful light, he thought to himself, Perhaps this child has been sent to me. She will surely die if I don't take care of her, so I'd better take her home. When his wife saw the lovely baby girl, she was so excited and so happy, she said to him, Please let us keep her and bring her up as our own child. They named her Precious Slender Bamboo of the Field of Autumn. Now, this baby girl brought the bamboo cutter great good fortune. For every time he went out to cut the bamboo, he found gold. And soon he was able to build a beautiful home in which to bring up the child. And he was able to hire servants to care for her. She grew quite extraordinarily quickly, far quicker than normal babies. Soon she was a lovely young woman with long black shining hair which reached to her waist. All the young men around, the princes and the lords, heard of this beautiful lady and they came to ask for her hand in marriage. But she was a strange, mysterious girl and she didn't seem to want to marry. It was almost as if she knew she must not. Now, the Mikado, that is the king in those parts, heard of her beauty and sent for her. But she wept bitterly and said, Please, please don't make me go, father because I'm sure that if I go to the Mikado and marry him, it will cause my death. Her father was very much afraid, because the Mikado was used to being obeyed. But instead of being angry, the Mikado visited the cutter's house, and he was absolutely astonished to see that the whole room was lit up by a soft fluorescence, a throbbing, pale, milky light surrounding the beautiful girl who sat on a silken cushion in the center of the room. As soon as she saw him, the girl sprang to her feet and vanished out of sight. Then he knew that this was no mortal maid, and he said to her, It shall be as you wish it, but please come back soon. Do not take your beauty away from us. So the lady reappeared, and everyone was filled with joy. Three years later, when the spring came to the land, the pink cherry trees blossomed and bloomed, the leaves were green and young. The lovely girl grew pale and sad, and no one could understand why. And then, on the night of the eighth moon, the girl told her parents that it had been revealed to her that she was a moon child, and that her real home was on the moon. Soon she would have to leave the world. The bamboo cutter was filled with grief, and rushed to tell the Mikado the dreadful news. An army of strong soldiers were set around the house to protect her. But on the night of the full moon, a strange thing happened. At the hour of the rat, which is between midnight and two in the morning, the sky was suddenly filled with the most amazing shining light. And a silver bright cloud was seen approaching the earth, its rays piercing the ground and striking the blossoms on the trees. As it approached, the people saw that sitting on this cloud were the moon folk, and there was a beautiful throne on it, 
the throne that had come for the lovely girl. Then came the sound of a mighty voice asking for the precious slender bamboo of the field of autumn. She wept bitterly, she cried, but she knew she must go. She turned to her father and mother and stretching out her arms, she said, How can I ever thank you for loving me and caring for me the way you have? I will give you my silken cloak, and each time you look up at the moon, remember me and hold it close to you. One of the moon folk then gave her a robe made of feathers from the clouds and a little phial containing drops of magic water which would make her forget her life on earth forever. Before she drank, she said, Be patient, I have one more duty to perform. And she took a rice paper scroll and wrote on it a message to the Mikado. I must return to my own world, she wrote, for this is not where I belong. Goodbye, your imperial majesty. Thank you for your kindness to my parents and to me. After that, the moon folk dressed her in the cloud feather robe, and she drank the special drops, and she forgot all about her life on earth, and climbed happily onto her throne and floated away in a haze of pure white light. Floating, floating towards the moon, never to be seen again. The bamboo cutter and his wife were stricken with grief. For months and months they couldn't stop thinking about her and longing for her and crying quietly to themselves. When the Mikado heard of this, he called a meeting to decide what could be done for them, for he was a kind man. All his wisest men put their heads together and thought and thought, and then they agreed they should take her letter scroll and the little wooden bottle which had contained the magic drops to the top of the most beautiful mountain in the land. When they reached the top, they set fire to the bottle and the scroll, and they dropped them into the huge crater on the mountain's peak. And from then on, the mountain was named Fuji Yama, Mountain Never a Dying. And for thousands of years, smoke and flames curled from it upwards towards the moon, a token of love and remembrance from her earthly parents. This is an English story called Prince Christian and the Pirate. There had been a great sea victory. As a reward, the good king and queen invited Captain Jolly and all the brave sailors to a grand party at the palace. They each received a bright shiny medal and lots of good things to eat. Christian, the young prince, looked on. It was an important day for him, too. The queen was allowing him to join the sailors and go to sea. It was to be a special voyage. Being nearly Christmas, their majesties were sending toys and presents to their subjects in a far-off land. The most important present of all was a Christmas tree, which was so tall it seemed to touch the sky. Christian helped Captain Jolly and his crew tie the tree to the deck. Then they hoisted the sails, weighed anchor, and headed for the open sea. Christian set about exploring the ship and having some fun, up the mast and down the riggings. Meanwhile, Captain Jolly and his crew were feeling very worried. Strange noises were coming from the hold, where all the toys and presents had been carefully stored. There it was again. The crew were afraid. Perhaps it was ghosts. Captain Jolly had to investigate. He slowly slid back the hatch and peered inside. It was pitch black. Who would go down? Who could go down? Only room for a boy and a small one at that. I'll go, said Christian bravely. Good lad, said the captain, and gave the prince his deadly sword. Christian climbed down into the darkness. He listened. Where could the noises be coming from? Here? There? Or could it be? Yes! They were coming from a large red box. The box was lying on its side. With the tip of his sword, Christian slowly lifted the lid and jumped back. The lid fell open to reveal... No, it couldn't be. Do 
dolls. As the ship rode about, the dolls cried, Ma, 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 ma. Christian laughed and couldn't wait to tell Captain Jolly. Meanwhile, Captain Thunder, notorious pirate of the Seven Seas, was sailing closer and closer. Had the lookout been at his post, Captain Jolly and his crew would have been warned, but the black-hearted pirates were able to climb aboard unnoticed and quickly overpowered Captain Jolly and his men. Captain Thunder, dagger clenched between his teeth, a wild look in his eye, swung onto the deck and shouted, This ship be mine, and you be all me prisoners. Bind him in chains, lock him below, and fetch me some rum. I'll be a-thinking of the sport I'll be a-having with them. While this was happening, Christian was hiding in the hold. Seeing Captain Thunder standing there, he lunged forward, swinging the great sword. A flash of steel, whoosh! The sword had cut Captain Thunder's wooden leg in two. He yelled and roared, Hold that lad! Take the captain and crew and clap him in irons below. Leave the boy. I've a score to settle with him. I'll make him walk the plank. At that moment, Captain Thunder saw the Christmas tree lying across the deck and thought, Shiver me timbers. A piece of that would make me a fine peg leg. Call a ship's carpenter. Make me a leg out of that, he snarled. Make it quick or I'll feed you to the fishes. The poor Christmas tree. Only the top remained. How sad it looked. But its magic was working. The leg was strapped on. Captain Thunder felt a strange tingling which made him want to smile. It got worse and worse, and his nasty face broke into a huge grin, and he felt all warm and kind inside. With a sparkle in his eye, he turned to the prince and said, What's your name, lad? Christian, sir, said the young prince. The pirate stood thunderstruck. Was this their captain, old Thunder, the terror of the seven seas? Laughing and speaking kindly to a prisoner? They slunk off to the far side of the ship and held counsel. He be gone mad, said one. Bewitched, said another. Possessed, that's what he be, possessed. He's not fit to be our captain, they chorused. String him up. They rushed at him and he was quickly overpowered. In the confusion, Christian slipped down into the hold. He had remembered the dolls in a big red box. They would frighten the pirates as they had frightened Captain Jolly's men. He laid the box on its side and the dolls started crying. Mama, mama, mama. He crawled back and crept up to where Captain Thunder had been left bound and gagged. Don't be frightened, he said. It's part of my plan. The pirates were so terrified by the sound of the wailing dolls, they fled over the side and were never seen again. After Christian had set Jolly and his crew free, they accepted Captain Thunder's kind invitation to visit his secret island. They climbed the hill to the caves where the captain lived, surrounded by all his treasure. Where did you get it? asked Christian. I stole it he said, and hung his head in shame. All of it? exclaimed Captain Jolly. Aye, said Captain Thunder, and there's worse. The whole island be full of it. Captain Jolly shook his head. It must go back, said Christian. The crew spent all day digging it up and loading it onto the ship till the island was covered in holes. It did look funny. Captain Thunder was unhappy about his island being full of holes, like a piece of floating cheese. But he had an idea. Could Captain Jolly bring him a cargo of baby Christmas trees to plant in the holes? And when they grew tall and strong, he could take them to all the children of the islands. So he could repay the magic Christmas tree for making him into a good captain. And so from that time forth, he became known as Captain Christmas. And instead of the parrot that usually perches on a pirate's shoulder, there sparkled the magic fairy from the top of the Christmas tree.
This is a story from Australia. It's called When the Water Disappeared. Long ago in Australia lived a huge bullfrog and he had the most tremendous thirst. He simply couldn't get enough water. He slurped up all the lakes and he swallowed down all the streams and quite soon the whole land was completely dry and all the animals and birds and fish were parched and dried up with their fur dropping out and their tongues lolling about and their eyes bulging, the little fish flopping about in the mud at the bottom of the dried up pools. The bullfrog had grown bigger and bigger because he was so full of water. He looked as if he was going to burst. He was so greedy that his mouth was full to the brim and he had to keep it tight shut, otherwise the water would have come gushing out. How disgusting he was. Now, the animals were very worried about the situation and they called a meeting. What are we going to do, they said. Because if we don't do something, we're going to die of thirst. I know, said the wombat. Let's have a concert and then we'll get all the animals to be as funny as they can to try to make the bullfrog laugh so that the water will come out of his mouth. That's a splendid idea, they all agreed. That is what we shall do. So they held auditions. The animals were very funny. First came the kookaburra. Now the kookaburra is a bird who makes a very strange sound, a loud cackling laugh that goes on and on. It's really quite enough to make you laugh your head off when you hear him. He also tells very funny jokes. Well, he got up on the platform in front of all the animals and he soon had them simply shrieking with laughter till the tears were rolling down their faces. Oh, yes, you would do something splendidly for the concert, they shouted. Jolly good, well done. And then the kangaroo had a wonderful act with an emu. The emu bent down and the kangaroo played leapfrog over him. The emu had such a worried look on his face. He thought he was going to be squashed. The other animals had to laugh at him. Well, they all did their bit and very funny they were too. Good, good, they said. Now we must send an invitation to the frog and get him to come to the concert. We'll hold it tomorrow night as soon as the moon rises. The following night, the stars were twinkling in the sky and the moon rose big and pale like a spotlight for their stage. The ground began to tremble and the huge bullfrog arrived in the theatre that they'd made out of stones. He was so huge by now that he could hardly walk. His webbed feet were spread out flat. His great body shook and gurgled with the water and the warts on his back trembled like jellies. He was quite unable to speak, of course, so he just sat and blinked at the animals in a lazy, full-up sort of way. The concert began. The performers were exceedingly good. But you know, the bullfrog had absolutely no sense of humour. He just wouldn't laugh. He didn't think it was funny. He just sat there, the ground shaking under him a little as the water inside him lapped and sloshed about while he sighed gently to himself. The animals by now were so worried they couldn't laugh anymore. They were really desperate. Suddenly, there was a disturbance in the audience. The eel had arrived from goodness knows where. Of course, he'd come slithering and creeping under the seats, as is the wont of eels. What's all this about? he said. He could hardly speak because he was so short of water, his voice was very dry. Well, said the animals, we're trying to make the bullfrog laugh to get the water out of him, but he doesn't like our jokes and he doesn't like our tricks, and we're afraid the whole event is a complete failure. Oh, said the eel, don't you worry about that. Wait till he sees me dance. Oh, you can't dance, said the kangaroo. You haven't got any feet. Now wait and see, said the eel. He slithered his way onto the platform, leaving a little trail in the sand. When he got on the stage, by the beaming light of the moon, he suddenly began to wiggle and wriggle and slither and slide and bend and curve and coil and twist and dance such a wonderful and fantastic fandango, tying himself in loops, in bows, in reef knots. You couldn't tell which was his head or which was his tail. As a finale, he stuck his tail halfway down his throat and bowed along like a hoop. The 
bullfrog's eyes began to twinkle. The bullfrog began to shake. His great sides heaved, his great lips trembled, and suddenly he began to giggle and gurgle and splutter and whoosh! His mouth opened and he let out a great ha-ha! And an ocean of water came cascading from his lips. The animals flung themselves under the foaming torrent. They splashed about, they washed themselves, they drank, they swam, they sported and floundered about in the cool, blessed water. And from that time, the lakes and pools and streams were never dry again. As for the bullfrog, no one ever saw him again. He left the theatre in disgust. Perhaps he found another land and drank the water there. Or perhaps he has begun to like seawater and lives in a cave at the bottom of the ocean. This is a story told to the children of Sweden. It's called The Old Lady and the Tramp. One day, an old tramp was walking along in the middle of winter through a dark forest. And it was beginning to get rather late. The sun had set, twilight was upon him, and it was bitterly cold. But he was a jolly tramp. He whistled a merry tune, and he felt cheerful because he could see twinkling away in the distance a little light. There's a house over there, he said to himself. Surely whoever lives in it will let me sleep the night by their fire and give me something to eat. The light came from the window of a cottage, and soon the tramp was knocking on the door. It was opened by a fat, rather cross-looking woman. What do you want, then? Please, madam, I've walked a long way. I'm very cold, I'm very tired, and the next house must be a good five miles. Please, let me come in and sleep on the floor until it gets light, because it, it, it's rather frightening out here in the forest on my own. What do you think this is, then? An hotel or something? I live here all by myself. I'm not going to let a stranger in. Oh, I promise you, madam, I'm a very respectable man. I wouldn't do you no harm. I won't steal anything. I should think not, indeed. I'm very poor. I've got nothing to steal anyway. And you won't get a chance, because you won't even get through the door. Oh, don't be hard-hearted, lady, said the tramp. Remember, we should help one another. Help one another? And where would I be if I helped every tramp that came to my door? I'd be eaten out of house and home. Go on, be off with you. But the tramp was very persistent, and he argued and argued with her, until finally she was so tired and the door was letting in such a draught that she said, Oh, all right, then, come in. You can sleep on the floor. I certainly haven't got a bed for you. Oh, I knew you were a good, kind woman the moment I set eyes on you, he said. When he got in the house, he saw that the old lady, although she pretended not to have much food or much money, was actually just being rather mean and stingy. She had a very cosy cottage and a nice big log fire glowing on the hearth. The tramp sat himself down in front of it. The steam rose from his damp clothes. He warmed his gnarled hands in front of the flames and blew on his fingers and got the feeling back into them. Oh, madam, it's a very cold night out there. You don't know how happy I am to be all cosy and warm inside. All right, don't go on about it, she said. Just sit there and keep quiet. The old tramp was beginning to feel rather hungry. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking, madam, but um, have, you, uh, have you got just a little crust or two that I could eat? I've told you that you could come in here and sleep on the floor. I didn't say you were going to eat. I've hardly anything in the cupboard for myself, so it's hardly likely that I'd be giving what I've got to a tramp, is it? I could cook it myself. It would save you any trouble. Cook it yourself? Certainly not. I'm not having you messing up my kitchen. But it wouldn't take me very long, madam, and I wouldn't make a mess, I promise you. All I need is a nice big pan and some water. Oh, a nice big pan and some water. Oh, well, if you're so clever that you can make a meal out of a pan of water, I'll get you one. And the old lady went to her cupboard, pulled out her biggest pan, filled it with cold water and gave it to the tramp. The tramp put the pan on the fire. 
Oh, thank you, lady. Now, I'm going to show you how to make some lovely soup. Now then, let me see. He put his hand in his pocket and pulled out an assortment of things. A conker, a piece of string, a pocket knife, a spotted handkerchief, a couple of brown feathers and a four-inch nail. He sorted amongst them, picked out the four-inch nail and dropped it into the pan of water. And what do you think you're doing? said the old lady. Well, madam, I'm making myself some nail broth. Oh, nail broth. Who ever heard of such a thing? But, madam, I can assure you it's the most delicious soup you've ever tasted. And he unhooked a big wooden spoon from the wall and began to stir the water and the nail round and round. Then he took a sip from the spoon. Hmm. Not bad. Not bad, really, for nail soup. It'd taste a bit better if it had a bit of barley in it, but, well, as nail soup goes, it's not bad. Oh. Well, as a matter of fact, I've, I've got a little bit of barley somewhere. Have you, madam? Could you spare me just a handful, just to throw it in, to thicken it up a bit, you know? Oh, all right, said the old lady, rather intrigued. And she hustled away and came back with a jar filled with barley and shook a few grains into the pot. Oh, thank you, madam. You really are a good sort, said the tramp. He stirred again and tasted again. Mmm. Yes, that's coming along better. Mind you, it'd taste a bit better if we added a little flour, just, well, you know, to give it a bit more richness, like. You know, nail broth really needs a bit of flour. Oh, well, I, I might just have a spoonful of flour somewhere, said the old lady. And she came back with a little bag of flour and shook it into the pan. Oh, thank you, madam, he said, stirring it and watching it get thicker. Now, now, this really is something. I'll let you have a taste of this nail soup. Oh, fancy, she said. Look at it. It looks quite nice. Look at what you can make out of just a nail, eh? Well, it's amazing, madam. It really is what you can make out of a nail. It would be a, <clears throat> a bit better, mind you, if I could just have a little bit of salt beef and a couple of vegetables, you know, a potato, a carrot or, or something like that, just, just to add a bit of flavour to it. You see, I've used this nail to make soup about six times this week and I, I think there's not really much flavour coming out of it, not as much as one would like anyway. Oh, well, just stay there. I'll see what I've got, said the fat old lady bustling away. She came back with a chopped up onion, six carrots and five potatoes. Uh, just put these in and see how they go, see if that's enough. And she threw them into the pan. Oh, thank you, thank you, madam. That should be quite nice. Yes. Mmm. Yes. The tramp stirred and tasted. Mmm, that's much better. It's bringing out the flavour of the nail, you see. It's giving it more a uh, soupy, naily, brothy sort of taste, if you get my meaning. Well, I never did. Fancy soup made out of a nail. Now then, madam, bring over a bowl. Oh, thank you, my fine fellow. You've really taught me something tonight, said the old lady, bringing across a couple of blue striped bowls and setting them down on the hearth. The tramp ladled them out, and they both sat down together in front of the warm glow. As they supped the delicious broth, the old lady said, I mean, it's so cheap and economical, isn't it? Just some water and a nail. Well, a few bits and pieces, I suppose, but mostly it's the nail. She felt so pleased that she thought she'd better put something towards it. She hurried away and came back with slices of meat and cheese and butter and bread and soon the table was laden out with a feast. It was just like Christmas. They had a bottle of wine in bright glasses. Soon they'd eaten their fill and drank until they were merry and warm and satisfied. The tramp, quite content, lay down on the floor to go to sleep in front of the fire. But the old lady said to him, Oh no, my fine fellow. After you've made such lovely nail soup as that, and we've had such an enjoyable evening, I think I might as well offer you a good bed to sleep in. She took him to a little room under the eaves, and he snuggled down into a warm and cosy bed. Good night, madam. Thank you very much, he said. And he clasped in his hand the four-inch nail he had fished out of the pan before she emptied the last drakes away. 
that's all right. I mean, uh, after all, we, we have to help one another, haven't we? And she closed the door softly behind her. This is a story from Poland. It's called The Jester Who Fooled a King. A very long time ago, Poland was ruled by a king called Jan. He had a splendid court, lots of courtiers, servants and ladies-in-waiting, and he had a jester called Matenko. A jester is what we would call today a comedian, someone who makes everyone around him laugh. Now, Matenko had been a great favourite for many years with the king's household, but unfortunately he was now very old, and his wits were not as sharp, and he wasn't so funny, and people didn't laugh at him much anymore. The lords and ladies yawned when he told his jokes and said he was a bore and told the king it was time to get rid of him. But the king was very fond of him and felt sad about it. He didn't really want to get rid of his old friend, but what could he do? A jester who doesn't make people laugh isn't really a jester. So one day he put his arm round his shoulder and said, Matenko, my dear old friend, the time has come for you to retire. I'll give you a little cottage in the village and few gold crowns. I'm afraid we haven't got much money. The last state ball left us almost bankrupt. And you and your wife can live out your years in peace. Matenko was heartbroken. He had enjoyed his life at court so much. He loved the glitter, the comings, the goings, all the visitors. He loved the great banquets and feasts. He loved being the centre of attention. He and his wife packed their belongings and walked sadly and silently down to the little cottage. It wasn't very long before the poor old couple were penniless. And of course, Matenko couldn't get another job because all he knew about was being a jester. They were very worried and racked their brains as to what they should do to earn some money for food. One night, Matenko suddenly had a very good idea. He tapped his wife on the shoulder. Are you awake, Elzunia, my dear? he said. Yes, Matenko, what is it? Are you all right? Yes, I've had a very good idea. Tomorrow you must go to the Queen and tell her that I am dying and that you are penniless and left all on your own and you don't know how you're going to live. Oh, what a splendid idea. Oh, husband, you are clever, said Elzunia. So the next morning they got up, and the old lady dressed in her poorest rags and laughingly said, I suppose I, I ought to look sad if you're supposed to be dead. Well, why not rub your eyes with some onions, said Matenko, and you look as if you've been crying for hours and hours. Yes, yes, what a splendid idea. That's exactly what I shall do. She went out into the little garden and pulled up a couple of onions and sliced them. My goodness, they did make her eyes water. By the time she arrived at the palace, rubbing a little onion to her eyes every few minutes, she looked as if she'd been crying for several nights, let alone hours. She knelt down before the Queen and pretended to cry. Really, it looked exceedingly convincing, with the onion tears pouring down her face. Oh, Queen, have mercy on me, she said. My dear husband, the jester who made you laugh so many times, has died, and I'm left alone, friendless, with no children to support me and no money, and I don't know what I'm going to do. The queen, who had always liked Elzunia, took pity on her and asked one of her ladies-in-waiting to hand her a purse. She took a little bag of golden coins and gave them to Elzunia and said, Poor woman! Here, take these coins, give your husband a decent funeral, and see that you have enough food and warm clothes to keep you until you join him in heaven. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're such a good queen, said the old lady, bowing her way out. 
she almost ran all the way home. What a wonderful trick it had been. Old Matenko was terribly pleased with her. She'd done very well. It's easy, it's easy. It's too bad you can't die every day, she said, laughing and kissing her old husband. Now, said Matenko, I think it would be a good idea if you died and I go to the king. Oh, do you think we ought to? said the old lady. Why not? I worked for him for fifty years. Surely he can keep me in my old age. So the following day the old clown cut up some onions, rubbed them in his eyes and made his way to the palace. Soon he was brought before the king. He walked across to the great throne and knelt down, his old bones creaking. Oh, your highness, gracious majesty, my dear wife has flown up to heaven and I'm left alone on earth, penniless, with no one to look after me. Please help me, for I'm a feeble old man. The king had always loved Matenko and he drew a big purse full of coins from his pouch and gave it to him, saying, Dear Matenko, it's lovely to see you again. Here, take this money. See your wife has a decent funeral and get some good soul from the village to come to your cottage and cook you a meal each day and clean your house. Oh, your majesty, said the sly old clown. You are good and kind. May God bless you. And he creaked his way out of the throne room and then galloped on his old shanks back to the cottage. Zunia, look what I've got. Enough for us to live comfortably for the rest of our lives. How fortunate and how clever we are. They skipped around their little kitchen table, throwing the coins in the air and shrieking with glee. Then suddenly, Matenko thought a very serious thought. If the king and queen talked to each other about what had happened, they would realise that they'd been cheated. And of course he was quite right. At the palace, the most terrible argument was going on. Matenko is dead, said the queen, and he has left a poor widow. Nonsense, said the king. It's Elzunia who's dead. She's left the poor jester. Well, said the queen, Elzunia was here yesterday, and she said it was Matenko who was dead. Rubbish, said the king. I've only just left Matenko. And so it went on and on and on. And finally the carriage was ordered, and the royal party set off down to the village to find out exactly who was dead. The old clown saw them coming down the hill and said to his wife, Quickly, we must both pretend to be dead. Come along. Dead? We don't look as if we're dead. Put some flour on your face. Flour on my face? Whatever do I want flour on my face for? To make you look as if you're dead. They powdered each other's faces with flour and lay down on the bed and pulled a white sheet over themselves, having lit a candle at each corner of the bed, and lay there shaking and giggling. There was a fanfare of trumpets. The king and queen had arrived outside their little house. Matenko and Elzunia lay under the sheet, shaking so much with the giggles, and the tears of mirth were running down their flowered faces. For heaven's sake, stop laughing, said Matenko. Try and look as if you're dead. Oh, 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 I'll stop laughing when you stop laughing, said Elzunia. You're making me shake all the flour off. Oh, 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 stop it, for goodness sake. The king and queen entered the little cottage and looked sadly at the bed. Our dear old friends, said the queen, I wonder which of them died first. Well, actually, I did, said Matenko, sitting up. Lie down, you old Fool, shrieked his wife, whacking him on the head with a pillow. You villain, said the king. You tricked me. Get up at once and tell me what you mean by this disgraceful behaviour. Matenko rose from the bed, looking very ashamed. White, flowery face, all little runnels with tears of laughter. I'm awfully sorry, your majesty. We really didn't have any money left. You didn't give me very much when you sacked me. So, well, yes, we did play a trick on you to get some more. A tiny snigger escaped from the queen. 
The king clapped his hand over his mouth, but out came a great guffaw, and the courtiers, seeing the king laughing, all burst out laughing too. <laughs> Why, Matenko, roared the king. That's the funniest joke you've ever played. Come back to the palace and be our jester again. I never realized how much I missed you. So they all set off back up the hill together, laughing all the way.